Jonestown, built as a multiracial paradise. There's no racism here, and it's the most beautiful feeling. As an example of how the world could live. These people really believed that they could change the world. Until the dream shattered. Get moving, get moving, get moving. Die with a degree of dignity. And turned into a nightmare. 913 died. Mass suicide or mass murder? The questions and answers on the final report. The 17th of November, 1978. Guyana, South America. Here, in a place called Jonestown, a U.S. congressman from San Francisco is addressing a diverse crowd of Americans. Young, old, black, white. Right now, a few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that uh, whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened in their whole life. Californian Congressman Leo Ryan is here to investigate the People's Temple, a multiracial, quasi-religious socialist organization. Jonestown is named after Jim Jones, the charismatic 47-year-old preacher who is the temple's leader. Some relatives of people living in Jonestown claim that he's holding temple members against their will. Who is Jim Jones and what is his message? Some in Ryan's entourage, which includes several print and television journalists and former temple members, marvel at the construction of Jonestown. It's a small village built by temple members and carved out from the thick rainforest. About a thousand people live here. Charles Krauss was a reporter for the Washington Post who knew nothing about Jonestown or People's Temple when he was assigned to cover Ryan's trip. My first impressions were really that it was kind of impressive in a way. I mean, it was like a camp, and it was almost like a frontier settlement in the middle of the jungle. People seemed to be well-dressed, they seemed to be well-fed, people were friendly enough. What has drawn them to People's Temple? On the day of Congressman Ryan's visit, Leslie Cathay is 20 years old and has been living in Jonestown for almost 18 months. The leadership primes its members for the journalists. He just told us we're going to look our best and we're going to not talk to reporters. If they come up to you, just talk about how great Jonestown is. Later that evening, at a dinner held in his honor, Congressman Ryan mingles with the People's Temple congregation. He's trying to gauge their feelings about living in Jonestown. Why did they choose Guyana? At the same time, the reporters who accompany Ryan get their first interview with Jim Jones. He was irrational. His answers weren't consistent. I mean, one minute he would be screaming about people trying to attack him, and the next minute he would be begging for us to, to understand what he was all about. It really was a disturbing show of someone who was clearly at the edge. He looked, you know, angry. I think he just looked... Like he was, any minute he was going to lose control. He was just, he was right on the edge. Is Jim Jones mentally unstable? There are other indicators that all is not as it seems. One young man passes a note to an NBC reporter. It reads, please help me get out of Jonestown. Other members deny the journalists access to certain parts of the compound. As I tried to move around, people would keep coming at me and sort of saying, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'd like to see a little bit more of, of Jonestown. And no, 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 you can't do that. Is this really the utopia Jones makes it out to be? 11 p.m. Jones allows Ryan and an aide to sleep overnight at Jonestown, but not the journalists. They travel about six miles to Port Kaituma, where they stay in a bar owner's home. While there, they talk to locals who allege that people are being tortured at Jonestown. We began to hear stories about guns, about people who had claimed when they tried to escape that they were being mistreated. The 18th of November, 1978, day two of Congressman Ryan's visit. Leslie Cathy is part of a group of eight members who've decided to escape Jonestown when the journalists return. 
they choose that morning to leave. Because of the commotion, it was so much activity. So we walked up this hill and no one glanced upwards. The press, armed with fresh allegations from the locals of torture and repression, pushed their hosts for answers. We were asking a lot of questions. We're demanding to see things that they didn't want us to see. All the secrecy and restrictions raise the question, who is really running people's temple? In the morning, this woman steps forward and tells Ryan, I want to go with you. I want to leave Jonestown. The reporters talk to Jones about the people leaving. Anyone who leaves the temple is labeled a defector. The NBC crew was doing an interview with Jones and confronting him. And it was that interview, clearly, that I think set the stage for what was about to happen. People play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. But only 16 of the 1,000 members decide to go with the congressman. How does Jones maintain such control? 3 p.m. As the defectors and reporters climb into trucks to leave Jonestown, a lone assailant suddenly lunges at Ryan with a knife. Other members intervene, and he's disarmed. Ryan is unharmed, but shaken. Ryan comes toward the truck, says, everybody get back in the truck. Uh, we're getting out of here. As the trucks rumble towards the airstrip, some of the defectors are visibly upset. They tell Charles Krauss and others that one of the people in the truck, 32-year-old Larry Layton, is a Jones loyalist. They were clearly terrified. They kept saying something bad's going to happen, and he's a part of it. 5.10 p.m., the Port Kaituma airstrip. Most of the defectors board the larger of the two aeroplanes, flying them to the Guyanan capital, Georgetown. Ryan and the journalists are still on the tarmac. Suddenly, a tractor pulling a trailer comes into view. I remember hearing pop, pop, pop. An NBC cameraman films this gunfire moments before he is shot and killed. And at first, I wasn't even sure what that was. But then I realized, because people started screaming and running, that these were guns. A bullet grazes Charles Krause's hip as he takes refuge under one of the airplanes. At the same time, inside the smaller plane, Larry Layton opens fire, wounding two people before being disarmed. The shooting stops, and then all of a sudden there were three more shots. And somebody had come over and literally point-blank shot the congressman five people are killed including congressman leo ryan nbc reporter don harris nbc cameraman bob brown san francisco examiner photographer greg robinson and a defecting temple member patty parks gunfire has disabled the larger plane but the second plane takes off with the pilots and one of the wounded the five dead and remaining wounded lie on the airstrip those who can walk half a mile into Port Kaituma to find help for the severely wounded and to move the dead. The 19th of November, 1978, 2 a.m. About nine hours after the shootings on the airstrip, two Jonestown residents who have fled the compound arrive in Port Kaituma. They tell Guyanese authorities that Jones is coercing people into killing themselves. A contingent of Guyanese soldiers rushes to the encampment. They arrive as day breaks to find this grisly scene. It appears that about 400 of the temple members are dead. But it's unclear how they died. Is this mass suicide or mass murder? While they wait for autopsies, Guyanese officials leave the bodies where they're discovered. Near the bodies are tubs of purple liquid. Investigators quickly realize that it's a grape-flavored drink laced with cyanide. Authorities place the initial death toll at approximately 400. 
They believe that hundreds of other temple members have escaped into the rainforest surrounding Jonestown. But when American soldiers arrive to remove the dead, they make a shocking discovery. There were mounds of people, and as we pulled off the uh, surface cover, we found more and more people under the mounds. When all the bodies are counted, the final death toll is 913, which includes Jim Jones and almost 260 children. At this point, it appears they died willingly at the urging of Jones. If this is true, is Jim Jones solely responsible for these deaths? This horror raises many questions. As we start to answer them, a story emerges about one man and the beautiful young women who supported him. Who is Jim Jones and what is his message? He is a charismatic Christian preacher who champions the cause of the underclass. 1956, Indianapolis, Indiana. 25-year-old Jones is a Methodist minister when he establishes the first People's Temple with his wife. He preaches social justice and the inclusion of all races in his church. Faith healings are also a regular feature at Jones's services, and he encourages his followers to call him father or dad. Over the next six years, Jones and his wife have one child and adopt four more. His church grows to almost a thousand congregants and opens a soup kitchen and a nursing home. Jones had such a clear message about reaching out to vulnerable people, feeding the hungry, providing shelter for the homeless. Dr. Mary McCormick Marga is a religious studies scholar who became interested in People's Temple after learning that her mentor, John Moore, had lost two daughters in Jonestown. Jones chooses from Marxist ideology the socialist ideas about everybody in, in a community being equal. During this time, Jones shows signs of paranoia. He believes he's being investigated by the government's tax department and that the Midwest is going to be the target of a nuclear attack. To avoid annihilation, he decides to move somewhere he thinks is safer. 1965, Redwood Valley, California. Jim Jones takes his family and the People's Temple to this town in the wine country, two hours north of San Francisco. Over a hundred members of Jones's Indiana congregation follow him here. What draws people to Jones's teachings and the temple? Jones's message of racial equality and the practice of core Christian beliefs. This fits in perfectly with the counterculture movement of the 1960s and attracts many young people. Jones calls his ministry apostolic socialism. Laura Johnson Cole hears about the temple's community work and joins in 1970. I like the multiracial part of it. And you know, Jim and his wife had eight kids and they're all different races. Everybody really did seem like a really big family. In 1972, Tim Carter is a Vietnam veteran living on the streets when a friend introduces him to People's Temple. As soon as I walked in the temple, and not seen Jim Jones, not met Jim Jones, not heard Jim Jones, but as soon as I walked in, I was home. Alan Swanson, who is living in a religious commune, hears Jones preach. He's so impressed that soon after he joins the temple. The way he spoke about helping others that were in need and, you know, he didn't drive around in a Cadillac like most of the preachers did and stuff, you know. He lived with the people and said he wore old shoes and old used choir robes. Inspired by Jones's message, the new members reach out as representatives of the temple to work in the community. We were doing things that were concrete that I could actually see with my own two eyes. And that meant a lot to me because I felt good about what I was doing for my life. During this time, People's Temple gets addicts off drugs, takes in foster children, and helps people navigate the various welfare agencies. It became a bureaucratic operation in California where they were going to attempt to meet the emotional, physical, social, and spiritual needs of the most vulnerable populations they could find. As the temple's good work continues in the public view, dark stories from within the church's walls filter out. Jones's faith healing meetings are set to be staged. 
Nell Smart likes the temple's racial equality and joins in 1972. But she's disappointed with other practices. I don't think he healed anyone, period. I think Jim gave people cancer <laughs> from the pulpit. You know, it's just, hey, call somebody's name out, you've got cancer. But I don't think he healed anyone who came and said, Jim, I have cancer. Can you heal me? As some members become disillusioned, how does Jones maintain control? Through coercion, intimidation, and manipulation. Jones encourages members to live communally with other temple members. Leslie Cathy is 13 when she becomes a member of the temple with her mother and sister. Basically, you were supposed to turn over your monies to the church. They had all your money. You didn't have nothing. You couldn't just walk off. Members turn over to the temple their earnings and their social security and welfare payments. Compensation for foster children housed by the church also goes into temple coffers. Jones uses sleep deprivation as another means of control. Hugh Fortson joins the temple in 1972. He likes the fact that the church helps those living in poverty. We got into competition. How many hours did you sleep last night? Well, I got maybe five. Uh, I got four. Little did we realize that all we were doing was wearing ourselves out psychologically, that we couldn't think for ourselves. As these darker stories appear more frequently in the press, Jones makes plans to escape the media scrutiny. Coming next on The Final Report. 1971, San Francisco. Six years after moving People's Temple from Indiana to Northern California, Jim Jones buys a synagogue in the Fillmore district of San Francisco and moves the temple headquarters there. Within a year, he opens another temple in Los Angeles. The folks that ended up coming were black people, elderly people, women with children, former prisoners, drug addicts. Because of the temple's work with the disenfranchised, Jones begins to make influential political friends. September 1972. The San Francisco Examiner runs a series of investigative articles on the Reverend Jim Jones. They highlight Jones's claims of raising the dead, his staged faith healing, and the use of armed guards to patrol outside the temple. An enraged Jones orchestrates a protest. His lawyers claim libel and threaten lawsuits. The paper discontinues the series, and nothing comes of the allegations. 1973. The size of the People's Temple congregation soars to 2,500 card-carrying members. With an organization this big, who is running the church? A planning commission, a board of directors of sorts made up of about 100 members, helps shape people's temple policy and goals. From this group, a smaller group evolves, an inner circle to assist Jones. Most of the members of this elite group are young, educated white women. There is suggestion of the cult that is to come. The leadership circle began to coach people on what they could and couldn't say to folks outside of people's temple. The women that Jim Jones had in his inner circle were very serious-minded, bright, idealistic. They were respectful of him. They loved him. In some cases, they actually were having sexual relationships with him. I think that Jim loved beautiful young women. And so there was a class system that if you were a beautiful young woman, and Jim, you know, noticed you and you were available at that time for whatever he had planned, then you were going to be a different class. September 1973. A group of eight young members, black and white, men and women, defect from the San Francisco temple. They send a scathing letter to Jones, accusing his inner circle of hypocrisy, racism and classism. The group becomes known as the Gang of Eight. This defection feeds Jones's growing paranoia, and he publicly talks about mass suicide for the first time. I've lost interest in this whole world. I would just as soon bring it a screeching stop in a one glorious moment of triumph. So you think about it. He borrows the phrase revolutionary suicide from Black Panther member Huey Newton. 
Jones had read uh, the late Huey Newton's book, Revolutionary Suicide, and put it together that this would be an act that we all could do to make the world feel guilty because they made us do it. Jones tells his congregation that the world outside People's Temple is teeming with those who would like to harm them. Well, he had these scare tactics to be a nuclear holocaust and that we only have the safe place to survive and that there would be concentration camps. We did paramilitary train up the hills. I'm talking 13, 14 years so, old, you know, preparing for some big nuclear wars. Jones and his inner circle formulate plans to escape from the United States. One of their ideas is to go abroad and establish what they call the People's Temple Agricultural Project. Why did they choose Guyana? It's an English-speaking country with a large black population on the Atlantic coast of South America. The Guyanese government is socialist and looking for people to settle there. The temple negotiates a lease for 3,800 acres of remote jungle. Jones calls the project the Promised Land. He deemed that we need to get to a place where our people can live in peace, can live in freedom. He said you would never have to hear the word nigger passed around. Listen to him talk about it. He would make it like, oh man, this is heaven on earth. Nineteen seventy four. Temple members clear the jungle and begin the construction of buildings. In this footage from a plane over Jonestown, Jones describes his ambitious plans for the agricultural project. Going over the beautiful promised land. You're seeing in the distance housing complex that are being built. The plan is for the entire congregation to slowly relocate to Jonestown over a period of 10 years. It's nice over here and everybody likes um, everybody likes it over here and I'd be glad when you guys get to come over here. <laughs> the members already in Guyana make these Super 8 films. This rarely seen footage chronicles the progress of Jonestown. This has been the greatest challenge of my life, being able to work down here in the garden. Thank you. People wanted to go. I wanted to go. Uh, my wife wanted to go. We, we were thinking that this would be a place where our son could, could grow up and, and live and be in a place where we knew we had a part in building it. Jonestown begins with hope and ends in tragedy. Had Jones done anything in the past that could have predicted this end? In fact, Jones has already held suicide drills. He calls them loyalty tests. Spring 1976, San Francisco. At a planning commission meeting at the temple, Jones offers 100 people in the room a glass of wine. Survivor Tim Carter is there. Everybody drank the wine, that was it. 15 minutes later, after the wine has been drunk, Jones says, you've all just been given poison, you have an hour to live. Jones tells his followers that their deaths will act as a protest against the inhumanity of the world. He lets the idea of impending death sink in before announcing there is no poison. What he's actually doing is exposing people to their own death process. Are you afraid to die? Because if you're afraid to die, then you're not really committed to what you're doing. Summer 1977. New West magazine publishes two articles about Jones and People's Temple. In the second are stories from Temple defectors, and they tell of beatings, coerced sex, and even death. The San Francisco district attorney investigates the temple, but the case goes nowhere because of lack of evidence. Jones's many political friends come to his defense, denouncing the articles and praising his work. But for Jones, the adverse publicity becomes the final impetus for him to leave San Francisco. He goes to his promised land, Jonestown. Hundreds of his congregants follow him. They're eager to leave the United States and to participate in his grand social experiment. Rice, black-eyed peas, tremendous inventory, they've got a Kool-Aid. Next on The Final Report. September 1977, Jonestown, Guyana. About 1,000 people live here. When we started, our whole effort was getting us to be independent so that we could feed ourselves. And then from that point on, we could branch out into whatever else we could grow into. 
The congregants regularly gather to sing anthems and participate in skits as part of their ongoing socialist education. There's no racism here, and it's the most beautiful feeling to not have those kind of pressures and tensions every day. I really appreciate the opportunity to work here to help feed people and provide a place so everybody can get out of that mess in the States and come down here and do something in a really cooperative atmosphere. Jones proudly leads a tour through his so-called promised land for the members back in California. This is one of the many generators that we've purchased with our sweat and blood. We have generators all over our property that gives us power for everything we need. The American man are nothing like these. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Sugar, seal, we have much more of this than MHI. Through all the trends inventory, they build up Kool-Aid. Is this really the utopia that Jones makes it out to be? No. The quick influx of people has strained operations, and there is an atmosphere of paranoia. Within months of Jones moving to Guyana, temple members follow in droves, and the population balloons from less than 100 to around 1,000. Jonestown was built to accommodate 300 people. We used to have a quarter chicken every Sunday, then as more people started to come, we didn't, we didn't get that any longer. So it was rice and gravy, biscuits and syrup, and then it got to be where there was very few biscuits, and then there was rice, rice, rice. Even if you believed in what we were trying to accomplish, it was a very hard life. It was crowded, it was hard work, it was a bearable life, but it was a hard life. With more people came the even greater need to control them. There was always crisis. Every week there was a crisis. That meant that uh, his extra security guards would come out. They had guns. Uh, I remember M16 rifles. We were going through the drills, pulling the children in the middle of the night, you know, pulling them out of their beds and taking them, running with them, like, for your life. That's horrible. The kids were traumatized. Jones keeps his followers on edge by claiming that his enemies are all around. Is Jim Jones mentally unstable? Yes, his long-standing paranoia has grown deeper, fueled by his drug addiction. He is hooked on Valium, Quaaludes and other barbiturates. Nell Smart witnesses Jones's decline when she visits her children and her mother in Jonestown. Jim was a junkie, and when I saw him in Guyana, you could tell that he had really deteriorated. He was a beaten man. I don't understand how the people around him could keep giving him the drugs. I mean, he didn't go out to get the drugs. So somebody got them, brought them in, gave them to him, and all that. But the rank and file of Jonestown doesn't seem to notice Jones's problems. When filmed by a fellow member, residents paint a rosy picture of their new home. Really, it's the most beautiful place I've ever been in all my life. I just love it. I hope everything is going to be all right for us. At the time, these people, like Tim Carter, said they were happy. No words could describe the peace, the beauty, the sense of accomplishment and responsibility and, and camaraderie that's here. But listening to his words today, it's unclear how frank he could really be. Jones didn't let people leave. It was a prison. I mean, if you go somewhere and you can't get out, that constitutes a prison. Now, if, you want, if you're somewhere where you want to be, it doesn't feel as much like a prison because that's where you want to be. Both realities are, were true with Jonestown. You know, people did try to leave, you know, and they were, they were punished for, you know, beat up um, and then ostracized. The 17th of November, 1978. Californian Congressman Leo Ryan's entourage arrives in Jonestown. Several members of the press accompany him, as do a few defectors from People's Temple. Ryan has heard reports that the people in Jonestown are being held against their will, deprived of sleep and beaten. Jim Jones is not thrilled with Ryan's visit. What did he hate the most? He hated the media, he hated the government, and he hated people that had left the church. And who was walking in on Friday night, November 17th? The media, the government, and people that had left the church. The following day, after the shooting of Leo Ryan and four others in his group, 913 people die at Jonestown after drinking a grape-flavored cyanide-laced drink. Was this mass suicide or mass murder? It seems to be both. There's evidence to indicate that a mass suicide was carefully planned by the leadership. The cyanide was ordered months before it was ever used. The plan for how to kill that many people in a short amount of time was formulated months in advance. It was as if the leadership 
was waiting for a moment when their suffering could end. It was as if they were waiting for a chance to have this martyr's death. But the leadership's lies and coercion support the idea of mass murder. Children don't commit suicide. Seniors don't commit suicide. What happened in Jonestown in that day was murder. It is murder from one sense because Jim didn't tell the truth. They were isolated from knowing what's really happening in the world. I think they were scared into committing suicide, you know. So if you're scared into doing something, it's murder to me. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. In this audio recording of the final hours, Jim Jones and others speak to the assembled residents of Jonestown. But in spite of all of that I've tried, a handful of our people with their lives have made our life impossible. Jones informs them that there will be a shooting on the planes carrying Ryan's entourage. Then the authorities will parachute in and torture the children. Take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. His followers cheer. There had long been a belief on the part of the rank and file as well as the leadership in People's Temple that it was all for one and one for all. Please get us the medication. It's simple. It's simple. There's no convulsions with it. It's just simple. Just please get it. Before it's too late, get moving. Get moving. Get moving. Don't be afraid to die. Then the final exercise begins. All right, but everybody get behind the table and back this way, okay? There's nothing to worry about. Everybody keep calm and try and keep your children calm. The adults who drink the cyanide do so for their own reasons. But the nearly 260 children who are forced to drink it or are injected with it are clearly murdered. And the older children can help love the little children and, and reassure them. Women aren't crying from pain. It's just a little bitter tasting, but they're, they're not crying out of any pain. One by one, each adult member chooses to die. No other way I would rather go than give my life for socialism, communism. And I think that very, very much. These people really believed that they could change the world. And Jim Jones took advantage of their belief to encourage them to see themselves as symbolic martyrs, as people whose deaths would be more significant in creating a new world than their lives. Appropriately, it is Jim Jones who speaks the last words on the tape. Take our life from us. We laid it down. We got tired. We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide, protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. Ironically, Jones never drinks the poison. He is found shot to death with a gun lying almost 20 feet away. Some believe that Jones did not commit suicide, but that another person pulled the trigger. It is clear that Jones is responsible for the deaths of his followers, but is he solely responsible? On the surface, yes. The only way that the suicides would not have happened is if Jim Jones himself had convinced his leadership circle that it made more sense for them to live than die. But he did not do that. The inner circle's responsibility for the mass death at Jonestown. Coming up on The Final Report. The 19th of November, 1978, Jonestown, Guyana. 913 people die here. Almost 260 of them are children. Because of the sheer number of the dead, military medical examiners randomly choose bodies on which to perform autopsies. Only seven are carried out on Jim Jones and six of his followers. Coroners determined that two people died from gunshot wounds. Jones died from a bullet to the head, some believed to have been inflicted by his nurse, who then shot herself. Of the others, cyanide poisoning is presumed to be the cause of death. Jonestown has become a gruesome benchmark for any cult-like group that ends in mass death. News reports on the inferno in Waco, Texas, and the suicides of the UFO cult Heaven's Gate 
compared these tragedies to People's Temple. But that's not the full story. Now, the final report on the evolution of People's Temple into a cult and the role of the inner circle in the Jonestown deaths. When Jones establishes People's Temple in Indiana, it starts out as a small Christian sect. The Bible was read from, Jesus' name was mentioned often, and there was preaching and healing and singing, and it was a very much a traditional church experience. Mary Marga tells the final report that when Jones moves the temple to California, the sect becomes a new religious movement, further integrating socialist ideology with Christian beliefs. In California, it was countercultural, but not yet a cult. People's Temple becomes a cult once they move to Jonestown. It's when new ideas can't get in and people can't get out. My definition of a cult would probably be Jonestown because you weren't allowed to leave, you didn't have any say so, you had no opinion. In Jonestown, Jones and his leadership created an insular world and used lies and intimidation to prevent people from leaving. We can't go back, they won't leave us alone, and there's no way, no way we can survive. On the final audio tape, Jones manipulates the members' commitment to the temple's political and social goals to coerce them into choosing to die. Die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. Stop this hysteric. This is not the way for people who are socialists to communists to die. May 1979. A congressional report highlights the events leading to the Jonestown tragedy and Jim Jones's role in it. Some journalists and authors investigating People's Temple have concluded that Jones is responsible for the deaths. Mary McCormack Marga believes that although Jones initiates the idea of revolutionary suicide, it's the inner circle that implements the suicides. Jim Jones could not make anything happen without his lieutenants, without that inner circle of committed people who believed in Jones' ideas and wanted to make them happen. Laura Johnston Cole was a temple member who worked in Georgetown, Guyana, where she was on the last day. He surrounded himself with people who worshipped him and who, you know, did a lot of the legwork for him, and he only kept the people who, you know, would never dream of turning against him or criticizing him. So he never got any authentic feedback on how crazy he was getting. Well, the inner circle, that's why, that's, they're, they're a big part of this. Jim was just a puppet, the one who gave the order. They, no one's going to take orders from them. They just pulled the strings. Jonestown had grown too quickly. Food and supplies were stretched too thin and couldn't provide for the nearly 1,000 residents. It had not become the self-sufficient, utopian community that Jones and the leadership had promised. What drove the elite core to seek suicide was their fear that they would be accused of hypocrisy. And therefore, they saw suicide as the only option that would keep them loyal to their ideals and also free them from a situation that had become untenable. On the last day, Hugh Fortson was in San Francisco on temple business. His wife and four-year-old son died in Jonestown. If I had been there on November 18th, I'm pretty sure that I would have taken it also because Jones had already built us up to believe that nobody would believe our stories, they would take our information and destroy us. If you knew that Ryan was killed and that they were gonna have stormtroopers coming in there shooting everybody up and you know mutilating the babies because this is what you're told, yeah, you're gonna drink whatever it is. Nell Smart defected from the temple in 1976. She lost her mother and all four of her children at Jonestown. We've been isolated for so long, so a lot of people probably thought that that could happen. If you think your child's going to be murdered or tortured or raped or baby, then what, what would you do? Leslie Cathy escaped from Jonestown with her three-year-old son. Her mother, brother, sister and husband took the poison. And we're all ready to go. If you tell us we have to give our lives now, we're ready. I'm pretty sure all the rest of the brothers are with me. <laughs> On the 18th of November 1978, the adults of Jonestown were ready to go, and they murdered their children before killing themselves. 
People's Temple flourished in the 1970s, a time when disenchanted Americans searched for answers outside established institutions. Although other cults also existed during this time, no other group is like the dark enigma that was People's Temple. Jim Jones has come to represent the worst of charismatic leaders who exploit and abuse their followers to achieve their own ends. And the temple members have become examples of those who submit completely to a leader and his message. These people surrendered control over their own lives to someone who led them to a tragic end in a place called Jonestown. <laughs>